So, I am um, Balwinder Bartler and I've been a professional photographer in London for the last eight years. Um, I've worked with a huge variety of clients, but my passion lies within street photography. Um, I'm probably most commonly known for kind of sh shooting like really relatable and kind of common moments on the streets of London, which is what I absolutely love to do. My name Mr Whisper comes from back in my uni days actually. Um, I used to do a bit of uh, graffiti and that's where it originally stemmed from but uh, I then picked it up again when social media came about. I didn't really trust the internet that much and so I thought I would use a pseudonym as, as opposed to my real name and Mr Whisper was my kind of creative outlet so that's kind of where it originated from. Photography kind of came to me, it was it was while I was working in advertising, so part of my job um, as a digital creative director was to get into social media. It was the big thing. It was Twitter, there was Facebook, and there was Instagram. So for me, I got into Instagram to kind of like practice what you preach. I needed to understand how the platform worked. But my only opportunity to upload was on the way to work and on the way back from work. So I started shooting these candid portraits of people on the tube which just by chance really blew up on the community of Instagram. So that's originally how it all started. I started off by shooting at my phone, but as I got more into it, and like I'd started to get approached by brands um, like Adidas, Lacoste and Jaguar, um, I thought I should take this a little bit more seriously. So I transitioned to a bigger camera. And my first camera was the Fujifilm X-T1. The great thing about that moment was the moment, the, the time I moved to a big camera, I was able to start shooting candid photography at night. Like people moving and being able to freeze time, which, I don't know, I was hooked from the moment I saw my first street photography image in pure clarity. So when I was using a phone, it was quite straightforward. There's not meant, there weren't that many functions and at the time you didn't really have a manual feature so it was only when I transitioned to a bigger camera, my X-T1, and I guess what kind of drew me to the camera was the fact that it had analog dials. So what I was able to do, I could visually see, as I switched the dial, the impact it would have on my image, which was a superb way of learning and transitioning from like a point and shoot, then slowly moving into like manual settings or semi kind of manual settings. The main difference between shooting from a phone and the, and the big camera and the X-T1 was um, the freedom that it allowed me. You know, if I was to shoot at night with a smartphone, I could only shoot long exposures if I wanted to like, achieve the image clarity that I wanted. But with the X-T1, I was able to go out, I could shoot people as they were, you know, going about their business. So ultimately, being able to capture candid street photography at night. So my journey to photography was pretty unconventional. I'd never planned to be a photographer. I was quite happy working in, in advertising as a creative director, but as part of my role, social media, you know, was playing a very big part of that. And so for me, I had to get my, like, pull up my sleeves and get my hands dirty and find out what it was all about. And it was through Instagram that I found my love for photography, really. There was, there was such a good community that supported the work that I was doing and through perseverance. And I, I, I guess I just kept doing what I loved doing. And this started, I, I, and I think that passion attracted clients and brands. So I slowly started to make a transition into like the world of professional photography. I guess, yes, London is my kind of main subject topic or theme that kind of runs throughout probably 90, 99% of my photography and the reason being is that I've always admired London from afar. Since being a child coming into the city was a very special occasion for me. I'd only be able to access it with my parents but just like the epic scale of it, the colours, the buses, everything that London means, the things that you'd see in movies. So it, it just resonated with me. 
and that kind of stuck with me throughout my, my, my life, I'd say. You know, when, it, when all my friends decided to move off to other parts of the country, I knew when I went to university that I wanted to stay in London. Also at art college, I stayed in London. Um, and then when I started working, I wanted to be in London. The reason being, I always felt it was like the creative hub. It's where things were happening. Um, it's, 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 it's just a great, I say, it's a great melting pot of cultures. It's where people come to visit. So you get to experience so many different cultures all in one place, which is what I love. And I guess that's, that became the theme of my photography quite um, organically, I'd say. The way that my photography improved was certainly by just getting out and shooting as much as possible. I was also trying to get involved with the photography community because you can learn so much from other photographers. The way that they shoot, you know, is something that you might not have ever even thought of. So it's really good to like be in touch with other photographers who are out there as well. Um, but ultimately it came down to shooting every day going back to my computer, seeing what, you know, what I liked about the image, what I didn't like about the image, if the light was right, if I could go back to that image. So a lot of it came down to analyzing and seeing how things could be made better each time and potentially seeing how I could control the environment as well. I think it's really important to kind of keep the balance between editing and shooting like a split kind of even because you can easily get caught up at just sitting behind your desk and over editing images over and over again where it's much more important to go out, shoot fresh content, have fresh images to work with and that means that you're just constantly learning from new material. I think looking back at my photos is where I get to see where, what mistakes I've made and learning from your mistakes is probably one of the best things you can do because the next time when you're out you're hopefully going to avoid those moving forward. My images have certainly evolved over time and I can, see that by, I can see that by looking back at my photography. I think when I was shooting back in the day when I first started shooting, I was less concerned about kind of the noise in the image or like the settings on the camera, which, which isn't a bad thing at all. But you know, as a result, you, you will, your images will suffer. So as, as time grew on, I realized that it's better not to try and save your images in post, but it's better to try and get a better image straight out of the camera. And then moving into post to just try and enhance the mood, evoke the story that you're trying to tell. Is that, that should be the purpose of the kind of post-processing. When I'm out taking photos, I'm looking for like small narratives, small stories, small moments that people who visited London or whatever city I'm in can really relate to. So it might be, you know, I'm gonna go and stick myself right in the middle of rush hour and get a, sh a real POV of like people's expressions and their kind of, you know, their kind of misfortune being stuck on like a, <laughs> a packed tube. So some stuff will be learnings from my last shoot. It will be like, oh, I remember, you know, I could have got a really good shot of this guy on the back of the bus, but his head was in front of like a reflection. So next time I'll be a bit more careful, position myself where I know that I'll be able to get a clean shot of that person. So sometimes it comes from learnings from there, but then a lot of the time it is stuff that happens on the fly as well, which, you know, it's, it's totally cool as well. So when it comes to post-processing, I really like to keep it as light as possible. I kind of keep my stuff in Lightroom as opposed to Photoshop, which I'm like, I, I fully know how to use Photoshop as well. But I see the place for show, Photoshop would be for something like removing that reflection or something like that, which I'm trying to tell the true story as it happened, that candid moment to capture the emotion. And by removing a reflection, that really wouldn't do the purpose that I'm trying to achieve. When I, when I come across a scene that I like or feel that it has a particular, you know, something that is going to give my audience, I will kind of, I will stop, I'll take my time to kind of try to compose the scene as much as possible. Ultimately, what it will be is I think I'll be walking to a scene and then I'll see something that catches my eye. It might be someone's like shadow that crosses like a traffic light or a headlight of a car. And I think, okay, that could make quite an interesting image. So I'll stop there and then I'll just simply try and recreate that scene by waiting for someone else to come along. I've been incredibly lucky that um, over the last eight years I've not had to approach anyone. Um, emails have just 
somehow landed in my inbox and jobs have come my way. But what I like about the fact that street, street photography has opened the doors to like a huge genre of different styles of photography for me commercially. So I've been able to shoot cars, I've been able to shoot travel, fashion, um, celebrities. Um, it's just been an amazing way for me to kind of explore the territory but stay kind of um, true to my tr stay true to my street photography nature. Uh, what I like to do is treat every brief as a potential creative opportunity regardless of the brand I think there's always an opportunity to be really creative especially visually for me so if it's something that I feel like how on earth am I going to be able to achieve like a street photography shot through this then maybe that's not the way to go th go forward maybe it's for me to explore different ways of being like creative with the camera. So I might take on a project and be, instead of doing something street photography orientated, I might try and do something that, where I can learn about stop motion, or I might be able to learn more about long exposure. So I think there's always a way to be creative with different briefs, and that's kind of the thing, that's the challenges that I've really enjoyed on my photography journey. I've certainly felt out of my <laughs> depth in certain situations. Um, I remember I had like, once someone asked me to be the DOP on a film. Um, I've not really had any experience of that, so I had to decline. Also, I've been, I've been offered like, kind of large video shoots, which I, I think I need to do some more learning before I get into video full time. But when it comes to photography, I am 100% confident with any brief, happy to challenge anything that comes at me and uh, really excited to, for any opportunity really. I think it's, it's, it was very helpful the fact that I came from an advertising background. So I kind of under, have an understanding how projects are planned and how they're worked out and how to manage client expectations. So I guess that gave me a bit of a kind of leg up the ladder when like things were initially kicking off. Um, but yeah, I think it's through experience. You take on the smaller projects to begin with, as they get slowly larger and larger, your confidence will build with it. You'll have an understanding of exactly what you're able to deliver to the client, meaning you're able to manage their expectations. Import I think one of the most important things as well when you're doing a project is that you should be learning something out of it. You should be understanding that whatever you're creating out of this, you're learning something or you're going to be, you know, ultimately the thing will be something that you're going to be proud of that's going to sit in your portfolio. Um, one of the lessons I learned early on when dealing with clients was the fact that you have to, it's just as important to learn when you can say yes to a project or no to a project because that's key in protecting the brand that you're trying to build especially if you start taking on projects that don't really suit your brand that could navigate you into a space that you don't really want to be creatively so it's just as important to kind of weigh up what the brand's gonna get out of the brief, what you're gonna get out of the brief. I mean, they are called collaborations for a reason. So ensure that everyone's getting something out of it before moving forward with any projects. I like calling it a collaboration because I want the client and myself to get just as much out of each project as possible. So I don't wanna be um, working on a project that I'm not into at all and that I don't wanna pr promote or support. I you know, genuinely want to believe in these brands. It should be something that I interact with in my life, like genuinely, so that I can really sell the benefits without having to fool people. When I really started to find my rhythm with street photography and really started to get into it and ultimately it became my profession, you start to think about what is it that you're trying to do. And for me, my ultimate goal with all the street photography that I do is about documenting the now. I get like goosebumps when I look at like the history books of street photography and I see a picture of Piccadilly Circus and I see that the lights are made up of like real light bulbs and the way that people are dressed, the colours, the typography, um, it's just it's just something magical about that and that's, current, that's what I'm trying to create in the here and now so that hopefully when people look at my images in 20, 30 years, they'll get an idea of what it was like to live in London in the 21st century. We're gonna be hitting my favorite spots around the West End. 
Um, looks like the weather's going to be like a bit moody, so that's going to add to the drama of the evening. Excited to share lots of tips and tricks with you guys. Got my Fujifilm X-T3 with a couple of lenses, so let's go. Stop. Stop. So we're at Piccadilly Circus, so you can see we can use the lights from the actual big screens here to help light all our subjects. I'm here at one of my favourite spots, which is basically this beautiful kind of old underground entrance. Now what I'm trying to get, what I do really like is the details around it. It's all very traditional. You've got the underground sign and then in the background you've got some beautiful depth and the bokeh from the Christmas lights. So really gives you a sense of time knowing that it's Christmas with the Christmas lights because I do shoot this entrance quite a lot. But yeah, the Christmas lights really give it a sense of timing. So it's quite important for me to shoot it again and again and again because there's always something different. My settings for nighttime, I keep it really simple as possible. Basically, it's in, I think it's called aperture priority mode. Um, basically, I'll keep the ISO set to automatic, and if it's daytime, it can go max of 800. If it's nighttime, it goes to a max of 1600. If it's anything beyond that, I'm really not going to try and shoot it. Shutter speed, um, again, in the daytime, I can go anything up to like 5,000, um, even up to 8,000 for the second. Um, but generally at night time I will keep it um, at the lowest at 1 to 120, 125th of a second. Um, aperture priority and then focus modes I will generally have it in single point mode if my subject isn't moving and obviously if they are it's a moving subject or it's a moving frame or I'm trying to track someone I'll have it in wide tracking. Just those two um, auto focus modes for me. Um, all, the, all my lenses have their aperture on the lens so that basically the dials are here and then the last thing that I need to control for the image is the aperture dial, meaning that I can get the right amount of exposure in to make sure I get the image. So we're going to start moving from Covent Garden towards Soho, um, but on the way let's just see what London throws at us. So we might kind of do a bit of kind of run and gun style photography for a little bit. But otherwise, if we see something of interest, we'll stop again, camp out and try and make the best photo we can. There's a good amount of people at the bus stop, so there's a nice range of people, loads of different colours going on, which will, could complement the, the, the end frame that I get. But what I like about it is that you can use the lights from the oncoming buses, and because they're moving as you're shooting, you get loads of different, like, different light effects. And I'm sure, you know, I'm a big fan of kind of rim lighting. That happens a lot when you're shooting people from behind. So I'll kind of move from the front to the back and shoot it from all angles. And then when I get back, I'll see what works best, really. All right, so one of the reasons I like this crossing so much is probably because of the scale of it. It's quite large, so you get to see, like, a good scale of people in the shot. So if I step back, take the shot from here, I'm going to get really small people, but I'm going to get like a pretty good cityscape in the background as well. So those, those are the elements that really kind of attract my eye, especially when there's like lots of natural lighting because we're really well lit with all the Christmas lights. So all those kind of elements are really going to help me create my image from this spot. Just, oh no, 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 no. Now what all I'm looking for really is just like the most interesting character. Maybe they've got a, a hat on or something that's going to make their silhouette a little bit more interesting. Now I was hoping he'd like take a puff of his cigarette as he was walking but I didn't quite get it. Okay, here we go. I need to go back. It's in the wrong setting. Right, now it's a little bit too busy for me. I'm kind of waiting to... I like to isolate kind of my subjects as well so that my image will have like a focus. Maybe one more. Sorry. Uh, so I really like to isolate my subjects. So I'll wait for the crowd to pass um, and then I'll wait for like the, the last straggler who will usually be running or they'll be putting a little bit more effort. So there'll be more body language as they cross. So it'll be usually be like a sprint for their life basically.
I'm gonna switch lens, but I might as well take you through my camera bag as we do it. So, what I normally carry with me on one of my photo walks like today will be, like I said, an additional lens, which is my 33 1.4 weather sealed. And we've got two additional memory cards in here, but I won't be using those at all. I've got 264 gigs in here, super fast SD cards, which is more than enough content. The additional SD cards are in case anything phenomenal happens while I'm out and I need to catch it. So they're just there for safety. Um, two extra batteries needed for the X-T3. Again, that's all I need to keep me through the night. That's gonna be enough to cover both SD cards. And what else? I like to keep everything as light as possible, obviously, but again, if the rain comes down too hard, I do carry a rain cover with me. This is, you know, specifically so you can put it around and it adjusts around any of the lenses. And I guess last but not least, some hand warmers in case it gets freezing. So we know that we can operate the camera okay. So, ultimately, yep, yeah, want to keep everything as light as possible. I mean, that's, you know, light, discreet, simple to use. I mean, I think that's pretty much the X-T3, it sums up the X-T3 as it is. Um, you know, it's, it's, when I was choosing what camera I needed, it had to be fit for purpose, um, both technically and aesthetically. X-T3 fits all of those purposes. It's light, it's super fast um, on the autofocus so that I know I'm never going to miss a moment and it's all beautifully packaged in this lovely design which really resonates with me being a designer at heart. So yeah, that's, that's, that's everything I carry with me. I love the X-T3 mainly because it suits me technically and aesthetically. Um, I think both form and function are both really important to me. One, it needs to kind of be quick technically so that I'm not ever missing a moment. It's got to be light because I'm carrying it with me everywhere and practically every day. Um, also, the image quality has never let me down. And also, you've got to think about the low light capabilities, which are outstanding. All packaged in this beautifully like kind of very kind of traditional body, which I think is gorgeous. I love the fact that you've got all the manual dials. So as you move a dial, you can see in real time exactly what's changing in the image so really helpful for learning as well um yeah small discreet and compact is just like brilliant for street and just as comfortable in the studio as well thank you so much for watching i hope you picked up some useful tips and tricks through the video here's a couple of tips that i want to share with you which really i could have done with when i first started out Firstly, if you're just starting, it's really easy, especially if social media is kind of your source of inspiration to copy other people. So what I'd say to you is don't worry about anyone else. Ultimately, it's you against yourself. Just make better creative one day to the next. As long as you're better than yourself yesterday, that's all you need to achieve. My second tip, and this is probably the most common one, but it's so important, is try and shoot every day. You really need to put in the 10,000 hours, as they say, to start understanding and really learning your craft properly. You can find out more about me on my Instagram channel, which is Mr. Whisper. Um, there you'll find like a kind of a slightly highly curated version of my street photography. On Twitter, again, Mr. Whisper, it's a little bit freer and you might see some of my B-roll. On my website, you can find all my client and professional work, which is mrwhisperstudios.com. But ultimately, I'd point you to my YouTube channel where you can get lots of inspiration and more tips like you did in today's video. And I would like to challenge you, if there's any tips and tricks that you have learned, simply hashtag Wex Masterclass and I'd love to see it on Instagram. Thanks for watching, guys. Mr. Whisper over and out.